your first time guest this morning, we're so glad you're here. And uh, just fill out that QR code, point your camera at the little QR code on the on the uh, row in front of you, and uh, just get get plugged in. We're having something called Welcome Home, uh, not next week, but the next. And um, so looking forward to that. If you're not serving on a a team here at the dwelling and you've been hanging around a while, I just want to encourage you to get plugged in. Um, we've got every opportunity from kids, uh, kids ministry to, um, to man, just making coffee in the morning. This is what we want to do is create a space for people to encounter God as a father, to discover their identity and fulfill their purpose. And that can be just as simple as putting out snacks. It could be just as simple as being that smile in the parking lot, helping some mama. To, how many mamas I got that's got diaper bags coming out everywhere and babies on every hip you got? You need three more hips. Come on. We just, we want to serve people. And so we make room for people. So if, you, um, if you're if you not plugged in on a team, I'm going to tell you, it's life-giving. If you serve here at the dwelling, can I get an amen that you get blessed? Okay. Uh, communities started this week. Oh my gosh. And it's been amazing. And uh, if you've not signed up for community yet, it's not too late for some of the groups because some of them capped off because they're like, I can't fit 45 people in my living room, you know? So there's still some groups. Who am I got open? I know Pooler 2 is open. Come on. Uh, Rachel and Dorsey right here. They want you in their group. Who else is open? Midtown's open. Who else? I can't see back there. Islands. Is Southside open? No. Okay. See? Snooze you lose. I'm just saying. Um, but sign up for community. You can go to thedwellingchurch.org. Click on that find a community. And the ones that are, are still open will be there. Um, yeah, man. Hey, let's welcome everybody who's watching online today. Hey, guys. We're so glad you're here. I don't know if you know this, but we kicked off live stream uh, several weeks ago. And it is rocking. And we've had so many people um, just kind of tune in and say, hey, you know what? I'm sick today, but I got to be a part of it. And I'm so thankful. So I know the team is behind that wall back there. They, they're not in here, but they're hearing everything we're saying. We so appreciate you guys yeah. making that happen uh, every week. All right. So we've been in a series called Glory. Yeah. Glory. We are walking through the book of Ephesians together. And I'm going to sit down, okay? Someone, someone said, Gunner, you get real teachy these days. Sitting down, got a whiteboard on the platform. So I, I just want to give you an overview of where we're going. It would be helpful if you get on a plane to know where you're going, right? And so we're on this plane already. Now I should tell you probably where we're going. All right, so what I see in this layout of the book of Ephesians is the first is this overview of inheritance and identity. I love how Paul just begins the letter to the Ephesians and he says, look, this is who you are, guys. Do you realize what you carry? Do you realize who you are in Christ? And I want to remind us all today, if you're in Christ, you have an inheritance and you have an identity. And when you see that thing and when you I think it's something we grow in. Like our whole lives is just realizing who we are in Christ and what we have in him. It changes everything. But that's the first part. And then the second part we're going to jump into um, is the glorious. So there's a glorious inheritance. And then there's glorious church. The glorious church. What's the church actually supposed to look like? How are we supposed to function together? Paul digs into that in Ephesians. And then the glorious life. From your personal life to walking with Jesus to marriage to family and to even your work, we're going to look at that. The Bible is relevant for today and everything that we're going, in, uh, we're li living through. And then that last one, when your kids are like out of the house, and probably about seven years from now, we'll be in Ephesians chapter six. Just kidding, it's not going to take us that long. But we're going to talk about glorious victory. And, and even dig into spiritual war. What is really spiritual warfare supposed to even look like? Like we talk about, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff, and it can get kind of wacky. But what is spiritual warfare? And Paul says he lays it out for us. And so we're going to be looking at that. And so go listen or watch the previous two messages. They're going to give you a background for the book and the series, the whole glory thing that we're singing about this morning. This is where we are right now as a house. We're going from glory to glory. 
And Ephesians tells us how to live that glorious life that God has for us. And so week one summary, I think if I could summarize it, I would say this. You are a glory carrier. Yeah. Week two, if you're going to be a glory carrier, you got to be one devotion, one single-minded focus on Jesus. We can't have idols. We can't be pursuing other gods. We got we to gotta pursue him uh, first and foremost in our life. And so today I want to talk about where you and I fit into this glorious plan of God. And so Paul starts out in Ephesians chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, turn there. If you've got a Bible app, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Okay, and I'll tell you why I'm reading from New Living Translation. I read out of this book probably every day out of this version. Um, I also supplement it with other translations. So if you've got Version Bible app, you've got all the translations in there, okay? Why I like to read from New Living is because it's called a, what's called a dynamic equivalence translation. It is thought for thought. It is not a, I want to do a word study translation, okay? It is a read through the Bible translation because it's just, it's not like, the, like Paul, especially, he's notorious for like eight mile long sentences with like 18 million commas in there. Well, New Living just kind of breaks up that thought, those thoughts so that we can kind of take it in better. I would encourage you to read, a, read this, but also dig in deeper. Yeah. Go get you, get you an ESV or a Holman uh, Standard or a, 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 I'm, lo I'm lost here, Nor New American Standard, some of those, and just really, I'm not like a, I'm not stuck on one translation kind of guy. Yeah. I just think all of them are good. And I think there's something in there that the translators or the editors have brought out from the original languages that we can learn from. So don't get stuck in a box. Just I'm just telling you why I'm reading from this today. All right. So Ephesians chapter 1, we've been through verses 1 through 8. It's taken us two weeks to get there. Week 3, we're starting in verse 9. Are y'all ready? Are you buckled up? Well, take it off because that ain't this kind of church, okay? Just take your seatbelt off. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. He has now revealed, everybody say revealed. revealed. Just think of that blinders coming off. He's revealed his mysterious will regarding Christ. So his will and his plan, the gospel, what Jesus would come to do, do y'all realize that it was hidden for generations. Like the, what the prophet spoke of was just like a little picture. It was just a piece of the puzzle. And they were like, we know Messiah is coming. We know the chosen one is coming. He's going to restore Israel. He's going to be the king. He's going to set up his kingdom. And then as revelation would build, it became like, okay, he's going to be on the throne of David. And it's going to last forever. There's a coming king and a coming kingdom. Throughout the whole of Scripture, that's what people, we knew it. They knew it. But do you realize you know more than Moses did? Do you realize you know more than Abraham did? It was it's the same faith, but the revelation about what the actual full plan of God was, you are living in the day where we actually can see it. It's crazy. What a privilege to know. But here's what I don't, I don't want us to ever forget, is that there are millions in darkness to the gospel. There are millions of people, many of them in our own city that we work with, go to school with, that we live next to, that their eyes have been blinded by the God of this world. This is all biblical. They cannot understand the gospel. Number one, they've never seen it modeled. They've never seen it lived out. They've gotten church, they've gotten religion and all that. Nobody wants that. They want a king like Jesus. And what happens to someone's spiritual eyes when they believe the gospel is the blinders are taken off. Yeah. And they can see. You say, well, why wouldn't anybody give their life to Jesus after hearing the gospel? Because there's something else going on that we can't see. Yeah. And that's why it's important that we make spaces for people to encounter God everywhere we go. If you have known Jesus and been changed and know what freedom feels like and know what peace feels like and forgiveness feels like and purpose feels like, then you owe the world that encounter that you've received. 
And so it's a responsibility. Do you realize what your prayers can do in your children's life to take that blinder off? Do we realize what intercession can do to take the blinders off of a city? We're praying in this room this Wednesday night. And I'm going to tell you, there's, uh, we had a big crowd last week. We probably had like 20 people in here last week, which is big for prayer night. But I'm telling you something, those 20 people know that there's something happening that you can't see when you call on the name of the Lord and you cry out to God for a city. He's taking the blinders off. And prayer and intercession is huge. So who is he talking about? God has revealed to us his mysterious will. Well, us refers to those who believed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The scoffers have come out when you hear the gospel. Any, anything, any talking about Jesus, oh, pff, you believe that garbage? The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why? Because they can't see. But it is the power of God to those who are being saved. Being saved. Not just were saved. Not will be saved, but being saved. Do you realize you are being saved if you're in Christ? You were saved. It's a done deal on the cross. Finished work. But you will be saved one day ultimately and you are being saved. That is just the, the position that you are in as a believer as you are walking out salvation. The gospel is still a mystery to those who haven't woken up yet. And so it's imperative that we realize what part of that plan we are we're in. We are part of that plan that God is, God is unfolding. Verse 10. So what is the plan? Verse 10. I'm glad you asked because Paul says it next. This is the plan. At the right time, everybody say right time. time. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. I'm going to read this again. This is the plan. You say, what is the plan of God? This is the ultimate plan. That at the right time, he will bring everything under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. It reminds me of Matthew 28. Verses 18 through 20, we call it the great commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, this is after the resurrection, and he's about to be ascended into heaven. He comes to him and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, even to the end of the age. We're coming back to that. He has been given, this is what we see in these verses in Matthew and also in Ephesians. He's been given all authority. And then he... Listen to what he says. He says, I've been given all authority. Go, therefore. So what's he do? He's saying, the Father's given me all authority in heaven and on earth. And I'm giving you that authority to go in my name to make disciples. Okay? Now listen to this. One day. Now he's been given authority. And he's given us authority. But one day that's not happened yet. All things will be under his authority. Okay, so there's a, this is where your brain's going to be, okay? Because in the kingdom, there's always a both and. There's always a both and. Yes, he's been given authority. He's given you authority to make disciples and go out to all the nations and and make disciples. But there is coming a day when it is all going to be consummated and everything in heaven on earth will be under the authority of this king, Jesus. And so we are caught up in this wonderful period of time, this blip on the timeline that I love what George Eldon Ladd called the here and not yet kingdom. The here and not yet kingdom. All right. Now it's going to get real. Okay. So let me show you this. So this is... What a first century Jewish person would be thinking about when you talked about the kingdom of God or the Messiah, okay? So I'm going to make two timelines here. Beginning of time, 
end of time, okay? Well, I don't know that we had, they even had an understanding of that. But here's what they believed, okay? Here's what the Jewish, here's what we knew. Put yourself in their position. You don't know, you don't know everything that you know. They didn't know everything you knew, okay? you know now, okay? So all they knew is the prophet said that there was going to be a period in time where the king was coming. And that when he came, it was going to change everything. He was going to set up his kingdom. And like I said before, he's going to sit on the throne of David, and it was going to endure forever. That's, that's why we need to take this off. It's going to endure forever. All right. So that's the Jewish idea of the kingdom and the Messiah. What Paul says has been revealed to us now is this. Creation. Okay. Now we're waiting on the Messiah. And Messiah came. But he didn't come like we thought he would. He was born, let's just do this, born, and he died, and he rose again. And one day, he's coming. The both end of the kingdom, he has come, and he is coming. Okay? Sometimes we need a visual, all right? He has come, but he's coming. He came and he finished everything, but he hadn't finished everything. Okay? Are you following me? So this little period right uh, here is where we live. Right here. Now, how close are we to this? I don't know. You got all kind of books. Tell us when it's going to happen. Why don't you write one too, you know, like put a date on it or something. I don't know. No man knows the day or the hour. I think we're, I think we're overly obsessed with when that's going to happen, that we miss our purpose in this. But that's just me. Not that we shouldn't be concerned with it and all that. I'm just saying. So there's something in this thing of us being carriers of his glory and part of his kingdom now, but not yet. Do you see what I'm saying? He ushered in the kingdom, and I'll just throw this out there. This is just kind of more, this isn't, this is more my opinion about scripture than anything. So I'm just sharing that. You can throw it away if you want to. But I think this, this verse in, I think it's Matthew, where he's talking about the end times, and he says, uh, many of you will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come in power. A lot of times we think about this when we think about kingdom come in power. What if it was Pentecost? The kingdom came, okay, he came and inaugurated the kingdom. He rose from the dead with the power of death, hell, and the grave, with all authority. He gave us authority to live this life until he comes. Yeah. All right, we're coming back to this. So pause, okay? Uh, yeah, stick a pen in that. Stick a paper clip in that. All right, verse 11. Y'all still with me? Verse 11. Furthermore, Paul said, I ain't done yet. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. What's his plan? That he would bring all things under the authority of Christ. That's the plan. When you see the words plan of God, think kingdom. This is the plan. This is the plan. Okay? First of all, he says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ. I want you to think of it this way. This changed my life when I heard this. United with Christ. So the Bible says we're far from God. We're strangers. We're, we're enemies of God. Did you know that? Apart from Christ, you're his enemy. No one seeks after God. Is this news to you? <laughs> we all want to do it our own way. Okay, that's why we need Jesus. And so what happened is this, when you came to Jesus and you got him in you and you got in him, because the Bible says both, he's in us and we're in him. That means we're inseparable. This didn't just happen. 
Yes, the Bible says you've been brought near by his blood, but it didn't stop there. Unity in Christ, being one in Christ, is not this, is this. Now, this will mess your theology up. This will mess you up. If you got religion in you, because you said, well, there's just God. No, I, I, can't, I can't say that. Jesus said it. He said, make them one as we are one. That's horizontally. But he says that you are one in him. And he actually said this in the Old Testament. I said this a few weeks ago. Old Covenant, God says, I will not share my glory with another. New Covenant, in the garden, as he's praying before he goes to the cross, he says, Father, I've given them the glory you gave me. If you look in Revelation, I'm getting off my notes. Are you okay with that? If you look in Revelation, and I'm going to get this, I always get these mixed up. They're giving worship to the Lamb. The multitudes. And it says, blessing and honor and glory and power and all that stuff, dominion, to, unto the Lamb. In other words, it belongs to Him. Yeah. Honor and glory and blessing and all this stuff. He said, yes, that's Jesus. Well, guess what He's given you? He's given you honor, hasn't He? Yeah. Undeserved favor. Yeah. He's given you glory. He said it Himself in the garden. He's given you blessing. He's given you dominion. He said, I take authority. So what Jesus has been given, he's given to us. Inheritance. Did you catch that word? Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. 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 It's a family word. It's a birthright. It's given to us because of who we are in him, not because we've earned it. It didn't say wages. It actually says our wages is death. But the gift of God's eternal life and the inheritance that we receive from Jesus is not ours in and of our own merit. It's his that he's given to us. Now, Romans 8, 16 through 17 says, Now, if we are children of God, if we are born again, if we do know him, if we've if we are part of this family, if we are children, then we are heirs. Yeah. Yeah. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So, I, I, y'all stay with me, okay? I, I'm telling you this stuff like, this, is the, this whole message is an invitation to think differently. Yeah. To think his way, okay? If I'm an heir... That means I'm a recipient of an inheritance from my father. Right? Which means if I have other siblings, I might not get as much as JoJo does or Donna. But what does it say? You are co-heirs. Remember, you've not, this has not happened this has happened. You are co-heirs with Christ. He has received an inheritance with his father. Both and you have received an inheritance from your father. And it's the same one. What Jesus has received, you have received if you are one with him and in him and he's in you. Now, you go figure out what that means. <laughs> That's on you. All right. Children are typically always heirs to their parents. As your parent's child, you're trusted with the ownership of, not, of what belongs to your parents even when they're still alive. So let's just put it in, in practical terms. If you receive an inheritance from your parents... You don't have to wait until they die to enjoy the benefits of the inheritance. If you've been given an inheritance, you don't have to wait to enjoy the benefits of the inheritance. The kingdom here but not yet means, just like if you were received an inheritance from your parents, but how many know you're living in their house now? 
They're feeding you now. You got everything now. This was the whole thing about the guy who left and found himself in the pigsty. He didn't realize he had everything now. He said, Father, give me my inheritance. And he's like, uh, I mean, you're here. Like, you're going to get it. You got it. And so I think a lot of times we're waiting for this magic moment when God just makes everything right. But we're living in a magic moment. Like we're living in the kingdom here, but not yet. And we don't have to wait. Listen, there are some things that have not been finalized, but it's final. So scripture says you've not only been adopted into the family, you're one with Jesus. What he's been given you, you will be given and have been given. So what's... I love how he ends this verse with according to the plan. What's the plan? You're going to know, you're going to know this. What's the plan? Kingdom. To bring everything under the authority of Christ. His kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Verse 12. God's purpose was that we Jews, and Paul was a Jew, and he's talking to Jews primarily right here, okay? So it's God's purpose is that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory, there's that word again, to God. And now you Gentiles, yeah. raise your hand if you're a Gentile in here. If you weren't blood Jew, Jewish, you're a Gentile. It says you have also heard the truth, and the good news is God saved you too. I'm just paraphrasing that. <laughs> hey, this is the part where you just praise God that you got grafted into the family, that his grace extended even to a sinner like you, and just give him praise for it. Verses uh, 13 and 14. Okay, this is where we're going to really dig in, and this is it, okay? So if you haven't been paying attention, get caught up right now. <laughs> Verse 13 and 14, Paul says, And when you believed in Christ, who's he talking to? Both the Jew and the Gentile, praise God, we're in there too. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit, don't miss this, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did the, this so we would praise and glorify him. There's that word again, glory. When you believed in Christ, I'm read it again, he identified you as his own. The Holy Spirit in you denotes possession of you. Okay? You are sealed by the Holy Spirit Sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. It's the both and again. The Spirit, when He comes, doesn't just bring the gifts. He is the gift. He is the gift. I love that word, guarantee. In the original language, it literally means, it's a business word. It means down payment. He's given us the down payment. He's given us the down payment of what's to come. So you already got money to spend. You follow me? It's not one day you're going to get that check in the mail. I'm not talking about money, by the way. I hope y'all are following my analogy. It's not one day that money's going to come through. It's going to hit my account. No, you have money now. You have a right of a, of a son or daughter of this king to experience the goodness of his kingdom right now in your life. The power of the kingdom. You think of this. What is in heaven? What is happening on the earth that is not happening in heaven? Whatever that is, we have the right to pray into that. That the heavenly reality would touch the present reality. And that's, how, that's, why, that's why when Jesus came on the scene, 
and he speaks, and they're like, you have the words of life. They're like, we don't know what that's like because all we have is like just religion and law that is heaped down on us, and the Pharisees are killing us with this stuff. But what you're saying sounds like it's coming from somewhere else. When Jesus spoke a word and the oppressed were set free, it's because the reality of a coming day became a reality in the present day. When Jesus laid his hand on the sick and they recovered, Peter's mom-in-law, she's burning up with fever. Jesus rebukes the fever. The fever leaves. Guess what happened? There's no fevers in heaven. And that reality just invaded her reality. When blind eyes were open, heaven's reality just invaded current reality. When prayers are answered, when miracles happen, when wayward sons and daughters come home, when the blinders come off, it's because the reality of a day that has not yet happened came into the day you are currently living in. And so, we have a taste of glory. We enjoy the benefits of a day to come. And our responsibility is, as we do the works of Jesus, as we follow him, as we know him, and as we apprentice under him, we can live a life like Jesus lived, bringing another reality into our own. So through our prayers, through our serving, through our risk-taking, through our faith-walking journey with knowing and partnering with Jesus, you actually get to influence this here and now with a not-yet kingdom. This is an invitation to think a different way. You realize this changes everything, right? So, have you ever heard the phrase, he's so heaven-minded, he's no earthly good? Well, that's true if you just got your mind here. But if you got your mind here in view of this, that's how we need to live. That's the life Jesus lived. We've been told that what we do in the present impacts our eternity. And that's true. But what if we began to think eternity ought to impact my present. Think of it in terms of money. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. And when I exercise my faith in the here and now, it actually makes withdrawals on the account and pulls this reality into my present reality. We've been given an inheritance that we're invited to partake of now, and faith is how we do that. You know... uh, Growing up, this question was always on your mind when you came to church. And it ought to be. Where will I spend eternity? And you need to answer that question. You need to know the answer to that question. By faith in Jesus alone and what he did on the cross, you can actually know the answer to that question. Because it's not by your works. It's by the grace of Jesus. By what he did on the cross for you. The question has always been, where will I spend eternity? What if we began to ask the question, how much eternity can I spend while I'm alive? Where can I cash out on what he's already promised? Instead of just trying to make it by, make it through until Jesus comes back. What if we've got more responsibility than we ever dreamed What if we've got more power and authority and glory given to us than we've ever imagined? What if we thought that way? What if we woke up every day, alarm clock goes up, and our first thought was, where's heaven going to show up today? Where's heaven going to break through today? And actually having the anticipation, the expectation of that happening. Do you know what that word is? Faith. That's what faith is. If we woke up 
every day with that mindset. God help us. God help us every day to make up with that, make, wake up with that mindset. Do you know what we do? We look for God every second of the day. And guess what? We find him. We'd find him and we'd see heaven breaking through. Good question to ask yourself. Kids, hold me accountable for this at home. Let's start asking ourselves a question. Where do you see God today? That's a good question. Because if you're looking for him, you'll find him. So this opens up a lot of questions of what, it, what actually is possible in this right here. Well, I'll tell you this before we close. Jesus doesn't put a cap on that. You say, why are you stirring up people's hope? Why would, you, why would you say pray for something that's impossible? Because that's reserved for another day. Well, Jesus didn't give me that option. Jesus said, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. He said, when you ask, don't doubt. He said, when you ask in my name, it'll be done for you. He didn't say, if you ask for everything but these things in this topical row here. No, he didn't put a limit on it. He said anything. And so I don't want to get to heaven one day and stand before God and have regrets about not having Cashed in what he's promised. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. So, could there be another, could there be, just going along with this theme in this series, could there be another level, another realm of his glory that you've not yet experienced in your life? Okay, so you know him. You've been born again. But if we're going from glory to glory, that's not where it stops. Jesus is the door to the kingdom, to a new way of life, his life, and the one that he modeled for us. And what Jesus modeled for us, the Holy Spirit empowers in us and through us. So he's inviting us to a new way of thinking. And having our minds renewed to the plan, which is everything's going to be brought under the authority of Christ. Where can that happen today in my life? Where can that happen today in my city? I'm not waiting for it. Jesus gave me permission to ask for it now. To to reflect his image in the now, to bring the reality of the kingdom into the now. All right, worship team, that's enough. Worship team, y'all come on up. And I'll tell you this, this is where it starts. We're going to go out with a, with, a, with a bang, okay? I don't know what to do with this. This is going to hide half our team here. Just kind of pull that over if you can. There you go. But here's what I want to do before, before we do worship and celebrate this sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm getting more that way like normally in church we're like okay now we're all going to bow our heads and we're going to get very quiet before we how about we just need in and celebration sometime about what God's done in the house and just just end with worship but before we do that I want to give you an opportunity you know this whole thing we've been talking about this kingdom life if you've never walked through the door none of this is going to affect your life at all you're still living like this. You're blinded to the gospel. And there may be some people here that have blinders on. And so right now in the name of Jesus, we pray and intercede for anybody in this place that doesn't know Jesus that way. That the blinders would just fall off. Just like Paul, after his encounter with God, the blinders just fell off of his eyes and he could see. We pray that over anybody listening online, anybody in this place today, that there would just be an openness to the gospel right now in the name of Jesus. And if you want to give your heart and life to Jesus, just right there where you are, say a simple prayer like this. It's not a prayer that saves you. It's not a magic prayer.
prayer that's like a peel, but it's a heart of surrender to God that says, Jesus, I want you. I don't want religion. I, I've done it. I burnt my, I've spun my wheels out on this stuff for long enough. I want the real you. And so I'm giving you my heart and I'm giving you my life. And I'm coming to you. And I know that I'm a sinner and I can't do this on my own. So what you did on the cross for me is enough. And I receive your free gift today. If that's you, stick your hand up in the air. If you prayed that prayer today. Come on. Got a hand. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate.